But how often? And all the time. Find someone nearby and say, neighbor, God loves you. And I do too. And if you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love into. Amen. Amen. Certainly it wasn't because you were living so good. It wasn't because you had done it so right. And it wasn't because you had aced all of the tests and did everything that you were supposed to do to be here today. But can I tell you, it's all because of God's mercy and his grace that he has blessed you this morning. You didn't have sense enough to wake your own self up this morning. Somebody had to come by your house and say, get up this morning. And I'm so glad that God decided to touch us with a finger of his love on this morning and allow us to see you. We didn't deserve it and we, we haven't done anything to earn it. But God just decided to bless us to see one more day. We got a reason to be thankful this morning. This is a season of Thanksgiving. We got a reason to be thankful. Preach you you say preacher you don't know my business you don't know what i'm dealing with you don't know what i'm going through who ties your shoes this morning you got a reason to be thankful who fixed your food this morning you got a reason to be thankful who drove you to the house of the lord this morning you got a reason to be thankful in all things we have a reason to be thankful unto god because he has been so good so good to us amen i'm, I'm hoping that everyone is, is blessed and everyone is doing well and i hope that as this week is coming that everyone is going to have a happy thanksgiving Thanksgiving and amidst everything that we have going on, um, let us keep it simple um, as we can um, so as to protect ourselves and to protect all of those that we will be around. Um, but all of that beside, did anybody come to hear a word from the Lord this morning? I believe you came to the right place. Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4 beginning at verse number 4 and concluding at verse number 9. The grass withers. And the flower thereof shall fade away, but the word of God shall stand forever. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, Lord, and hear my humble cry, Lord. Our calling, Master, and do not pass me by, and y'all call him your Savior, oh sweet Savior, Savior, why don't you hear my my humble cry, Lord, and why on earth I are calling, Master, and do not pass me by well and die the spring of all my comfort more is more than life to me well and who have I on earth beside thee, Lord, and whom in heaven but thee, and y'all call him your Savior, oh, sweet Savior. Savior, why don't you hear my, my humble cry, Lord, and why on others I are calling, Master, and do 
now pass me by and y'all call him your savior oh sweet savior why don't you hear my my humble cry Lord, and why on others I are calling, Master, and do not pass me by. Psalms, um, Philippians chapter 4. Psalms is good too, but Philippians chapter 4. Amen. Amen. Beginning at verse number 4. And the Bible reads it like this. Rejoice in the Lord. How often? And again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace shall be with you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, dear Lord, be acceptable in thy sight. I want to give for our subject on this morning, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, and again I say rejoice. If you read the life of the Apostle Paul, and if you study his experiences and his challenges, his circumstances and his situations, I think you would come to the conclusion that if there was anyone that had any cause to complain, to moan or groan, it would have been the Apostle Paul. But at the same time, Paul does not worry. Paul is not stressed out. Paul is not upset. Paul writes these words, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Now understand, he's serving time in prison in Philippi, which is in the province of Rome, sitting in prison with chains on his hands and chains on his feet. While Paul is in this particular predicament, he still writes these words, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. He was in prison because he'd been on a missionary journey, and he was traveling to Macedonia, and he went over into the province of Philippi, and when he got to Philippi, one day he was in the marketplace, and he saw a slave girl who was being used by her masters, and the scripture says in Acts to bring much gain. The Bible says that hey, she had a spirit, a python spirit. She was a psychic and she predicted the future. And when Paul came along with Silas and walked by, they began to cry, these are the men of the most high God. And they followed Paul and they began to help Paul until he turned around and exercised the spirit out of that young girl. And once Paul exercised the spirit out of her, it was clear to her masters that she was of no more use to them. These people became upset with Paul, particularly the businessmen were upset and so much that they beat Paul and drug him through the streets and put that brother in jail and they charged Paul with subverting the Roman law when they were on trial. The judge sided with the businessman, I believe because he gave him a little something on the table you know, money talk, everything else walk and he sided with them and left Paul in a Roman jail with Paul not understanding whether this would lead to his execution or whether or not he was going to be let go. Paul does not have a public defender. Johnny Cochran is not on call. He does not have a public defender. Paul does not have money to go his bail, but the apostle Paul begins to write. He puts pen to paper and he writes these words to the people of God that are there at Philippi and he says, don't worry about anything. 
I want you to rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Now, doesn't it seem kind of cultural? Because Paul is in a bad situation. Paul is in a bad predicament. Paul's got everything going against him, but yet in the midst of all of that, Paul still challenges and commands the people of God to rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Some of us got a problem rejoicing when things are going well, let alone when things are going bad. Man, let alone with things when we're going through all kinds of rough patches in our life. And Paul says, I want you to rejoice. He doesn't talk about how long he got to serve. He doesn't talk about the fact that this could lead to his death. The only thing Paul says is rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Beloved, the reason Paul says rejoice again, I believe that every child of God has to grow to the place in your relationship with God that you are able to rejoice when circumstances are not in your favor. I say, even when things aren't going the way that you want them to go, you can still praise God as if things are working out the way you want them to work out. That's the place that your faith has to grow through because as a child of God, you recognize that God's ways 100% of the time are not your ways. God's plans 100% of the time are not your plan. And when God overts your plans and puts his plans in motion, you got to say, well, Lord, this must be the best thing for me because you would not bring me to this. You would not put me on this path if it was not for your good and for your glory every child of God must not be controlled and manipulated by what you see but whether have greater value in the unseen because you know that God is working behind the scenes always to change situations. I believe that when you're facing something that is in opposition to you, this is not the time for you to throw a pity party. This is not the time for you to send out an RSVP to anybody, but this is time for you to stand firmly on your two feet, square your shoulders, and declare that I'm going to rejoice my way out of this situation. Beloved, when the enemy sends his imps against you as a child of God you ought not worry you ought not fret you ought not pull your hair out because you know that the word is already declared that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper he didn't say it wouldn't be formed he just said it wasn't going to prosper. Thank God that no, that no matter what the devil says up, he might set it up, but no weapon formed against me shall be able to succeed in what it was set out to do. And so Paul tells them to rejoice. He says, don't be anxious about anything. Any of y'all ever been anxious? I know, I know. I know some of us anxious right now. We don't know. We don't know. Well, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? But he says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything. Listen, it's almost counter when you see people who claim Christ that are stressed out. What you stressed out for? I, I, I get tired of Christians that are always taking you back to their problems. Because they don't have enough praise to promote them beyond their perplexities in life. I believe that if you are a child of God filled with the spirit of God, I believe that if God is reigning and ruling in your life, then no matter what comes your way, you might have a momentary setback. But my brothers and sisters, there ought to be something on the inside of you that said, I'm going to face this thing with God on my side. And as long as God is on my side, I know I shall be victorious. I, I, I don't know. As I look over this room, there are those that may be, maybe who are anxious. You're anxious because you are waiting on something in your life. Worried about when my season is coming. When things are going to turn around in my favor. When things are going to shift. When my breakthrough is coming. You may be worried about what you're facing because you don't know how it's going to turn out. But I came to tell you this morning that the word of the Lord says that you ought to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I don't care how bad it looks, you ought to rejoice. I don't care how tiring it becomes, you ought to rejoice. I don't care how misused you may feel sometimes, you ought to still rejoice. I believe that every believer under the sound of my voice can find an excuse 
if I ask you to find an excuse to worry, if you can come to, it's very easy for you to find an excuse to be able to do that. But you are no longer what you used to be. When you were in the world, you worried about stuff. But now that you're in the kingdom of God, God is backing you up. So Paul says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Listen, beloved, God says you don't have to spend your life being pulled in different directions. Your faith and hope is pulling you in one direction. Your fears and your doubts are pulling you in another direction. And you feel like you're being pulled about. If you've ever worried, you know how it strangles you. It, it, it does, doesn't it strangle you when you're worried about something. If you've ever worried, you know the side effects. You got neck pains. You got ulcers you got your digestive system is off and Paul starts out saying you don't need to go through any of that but you need to rejoice and again I say rejoice sounds simple don't it I know it's important because Paul says it twice and again I say rejoice now let me show you why Paul is sharing this with us number one rejoicing is a discipline and not an emotion Dependent on your circumstances. I believe I'll say that one more time. I said that rejoicing is a discipline and not an emotion that is solely dependent upon your circumstances. Rejoicing has to do with how you see things from God's point of view. You have to understand that everybody doesn't know what God is doing in your life and can't understand what God is doing in your life. But when you have a relationship with God, you can understand the activity of God because his activity is not manifest to anyone outside, but rather to the one that's going through the situation. And some people can look at your situation and judge you. And talk about you. But what they don't understand is God is in the activity. And they don't understand. Folk can see what God is doing in your life. Tell your neighbor, you really can't see me. You can't see what I'm dealing with when I'm going through my test. From the outside, you can see my stress. And you can see my issues I'm facing. But what you can't see is the unseen presence of God that is working things out on my behalf. I want to know anybody this morning ever had trials in your life. Anybody ever really went through some trials? Can I suggest to you that God is working in the midst of those trials? Everybody can't see what God is doing when you're struggling in the midst of sickness in your body and depression. But I'm here to affirm that God is working on your behalf. You may have thought that God had forgotten about you. I came to tell you he ain't forgot about you. God is just not getting started. The very moment that you think God ain't doing nothing, God is really up to something. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel don't let go of your faith you hold on and wait until God shows up so we've had we've had trials in our life we got setbacks in our life we anybody ever been set back in your life man I took 10 steps forward now I'm not back 30 steps backwards what am I doing wrong when is this going to be made better trouble on every hand well I'm here to tell you that setbacks and trouble are not to be isolated from the presence of God I'm not emotionally dependent upon my circumstances. You see, I don't have to have everything going in my favor in order for me to have favor with God. I say I don't have to have everything going in my favor in order for me to have favor with God. I don't have to have everything coming out the way that I wanted to. I can rejoice on a bad day. I can rejoice on a good day. I can rejoice on a rainy day. I can rejoice on a sunshiny day. In all times, I can rejoice. Too many of us, we emotionally driven. Things going well, we all up and out. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Gee, God is good to me. You call your phone, child. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Don't you be calling me with no mess. That's all I'll say. But when things aren't going well, you can hear a rat walking on kind. And that's what upsets the devil. When you're going through hell 
and you still got a praise on the inside of you. When you are going through hell and you still got a hallelujah on the inside of you, the devil does not understand it. After everything I sent your way, after everything I put in your path to try and take you down, yet it's still, you still standing. My second reason to rejoice is because that which is unseen always counters that which is seen and causes me to rejoice. That's why my rejoicing is powerful. It's subverted because if I rejoice long enough, God gonna answer my cry. And it frustrates the enemy. The enemy cannot stand a child of God that got a spirit of rejoicing. That's why the devil hates to see you rejoice. That's why the devil sends his imps out to sit on the road with you on Sunday morning. Because the minute you open your mouth to tell God thank you, they're looking at you crazy. I wonder what she's going through. I wonder what she's dealing with. What she doing all that for? It ain't none of your business. If you recognize who you are serving, if you recognize who is blessing you, you wouldn't be looking at me because you'd be too busy trying to give God praise for yourself. Yeah, I know you may be bothered by my having it, but if you can't stand what I'm doing right now, man, just wait till I get on the other side. Man, if you don't like me right now, wait until this pandemic is over and I really get to praise God for what it brought me through. So, so he says, so the enemy sends people down, but if God has been good to you, and when God has made a way for you, if God has ever healed your body and if God has ever delivered you, you ain't got no reason, you ain't got no other choice but to let somebody know what God has done for you. The Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord, you ought to say something about it. Because this morning when I rose, I didn't have no doubt who woke me up this morning. When I rose up this morning, I didn't have no doubt who gave me the activity of my life. I know it wasn't nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. So Lord, he can't, so the enemy cannot stand when we rejoice. And so I know many of us in this place as of late, we, we all of us, we've experienced death. We've been having loss of loved ones. And, and, and at times, you can be bothered by the heaviness. That's a natural response to be bothered by heaviness. But what I want you to understand is that you should not cave in to your emotions. Your emotions are not contingent upon your circumstances. Your emotions are dependent upon the word of God. Didn't you hear David when he said, weeping may endure for a night, but joy was going to come in the morning. That don't mean go to sleep. Wake up in the morning, the joy is going to be there. Just keep on waking up. Keep on telling. God, thank you. Sooner or later, your joy gonna be knocking on your door. Tell somebody, I want the devil to scratch his head because he can't figure out why my situation hasn't been able to bury me. Y'all, y'all remember the story of the goat in the well? Oh, they said that they thought they was gonna bury that old goat, and they took that old goat and they threw him down in the well, and they got the shovel and they started digging up dirt, throwing it down on top of the goat. Throwing it on top of them. Just, and they just knew that they was going to bury that goat. Said, man, by the time they thought the boat was going to be buried, they didn't know that every time they was putting dirt out in there, he just trampled it under his feet. Put a little more dirt down there, he just trampled it under his feet. You got to recognize that when the devil throws stuff your way, you just got to trample it on your feet. Throw sickness my way, I'm going to just trample it under my feet. Throw some temptation my way, I'm just going to trample it under my feet. Because what you thought was going to take me out is only taking me to a higher place in God. I see somebody saying, you thought you was going to bury me, but you didn't recognize I was a seed. He can't figure out. Why you worship the way that you do? And you know you got trouble in your life. Why are you more focused on your worship than you are your problems? He cannot understand it. How can that child of God go through all of that pain 
And you still have a praise on the inside of you. It just doesn't make sense to him. He's been trying to get to the origin. Trying to get to the root. And all the pain that you endured. How can you be kicked to the curb. Thrown under the bus. And still raise your hand and say. Lord I need your help. Because I'm trying to get. God says in your spirit. We have a reason to rejoice. The battle, we can rejoice before the battle is even won. Because the Bible has already known that we are already victorious because of what Christ has already done for us. As long as you're fighting on God's side, and as long as God is with you, child of God, you are victorious. That's why Paul said that we can't be anxious. You can't be anxious. Tell somebody, stop being anxious. Stop being, stop being anxious. Instead of worrying about everything, anything, and everything, Paul says, listen, pray about everything. Pray about everything. He said, don't worry about anything, but rather pray about everything. And I know folks say it, don't take all that, man. Every time I see you at the church, every time I look at you, you're talking to God. But they don't understand the reason we do is because it keeps our mind in perfect peace. The Bible says that I would keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. If I didn't talk to God, man, I'd go cuckoo for cocoa puss. If I, if I didn't talk to God, I would lose my very mind. I would lose if I did not have God on my mind. And so he says, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And on this side, don't worry about anything. But on this side, pray about everything. And the peace of God will guide your mind and spirit in Christ Jesus. Follow me if you if you if you going to worry about something, don't pray about it. And if you going to pray about something, don't worry about Lord G and the peace of God will guide your mind and spirit between anything and everything there's prayer. And so if I keep on praying, what I'm worried about is going to be reversed and God is going to give me a resolution so I'm not worried about what I see but whether I'm praying about what God is getting ready to do in my life. Beloved God, God will show you that he has unlimited options. He will show you that he has unlimited options. You never ever thought about or even considered. Don't you know that eyes have not seen? Ears have not heard? Don't you know that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask? Because God's got options that you ain't even considered. God's got a way of dealing with stuff that you can't even comprehend. So why are you still trying to figure it out? Stop it! It ain't your job. Your job is to go on and rejoice. I know I'm in it, but I'm rejoicing because I'm on my way out of it. I say I know I'm in it right now. I know I'm in a bad place right now, but I'm rejoicing because I don't know when, but I know for a fact God's going to bring me about this thing. There's something, there's something called, something called purposeful abandonment. And sometimes, beloved, you have to purposely leave stuff alone. I mean, you got to purposely leave them. You got to plan to leave them no good. Fucker. You got to plan to leave that no good stuff. You got to plan to get that stuff out of your life. Sometimes you have to disengage your mental capacity and leave stuff alone. Because the sooner you leave stuff alone, the more it gives God an opportunity to come and show up and work things out in your life. I know when I start rejoicing, things are going to get better. I know when I start rejoicing that God has to show up on my behalf and cause things to work out. Paul said, listen, I know, I know, I know I'm in a bad place. Some of y'all this morning, you said, preacher, I'm in a bad place. You just don't know, you just don't know. I'm in a bad place. Line yourself up with Paul this morning. Paul said, I know I'm in a bad place. I'm only locked up. Because I was doing what God told me to do. Any of y'all ever been in trouble for doing right? 
Any of y'all, any of y'all ever been trying to do what you know you were supposed to do and you still found yourself in trouble? Paul said, look at me, man, I know that I am here where I am because of what I've been doing for God. Yeah. Paul could have wrote about anything. Yeah. If it would have been me, I would have been trying to find three of the four best men I know that can take somebody down. Hey, y'all come get me up out of here. I know the guards go to sleep around 10 o'clock and they be exchanging. I'm going to need y'all to come through. Don't you can't, you can't slide. I need you to come, come up in here and bust a move. Get me up out of here. Craig, I need some help. Get me up out of here, man. He could have wrote anything. He could have wrote anything to the people of God. But what I love about this, man, and what I love about Paul is that, like Christ, a lot of times, he was more concerned about the people than he was himself. Paul said, you know what? I, I know. I know it's a possibility. I ain't going to make it out of here. This might, this might be the last letter that you ever get to read from me. I know that is a fact. I know that is a fact. But the last thing I want to leave with you, rejoice. Rejoice. How, how, how can you be in a dungeon, chained, hands and feet, and still telling somebody to rejoice? Apparently he has something on the inside, working on the outside. Bringing about a change in his life. And let me tell you, child of God, when you know you're living for God, when you know you're serving God, and you know you're doing the will of God, and you're being persecuted, you're being talked about for the name of Christ, you don't worry about anything because you know, man, you talk about it as much as you want. Throw rocks at me, put me in jail. One of these days, my God is going to reward me for my faithfulness. He's going to remo reward me for my faithfulness. And that's why that same man was able to say, I fought a good fight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The same man, the same man that was right here in prison, not knowing whether or not this was going to lead to his execution or whether or not he would be let go. He still let on say, you know what? I fought a good fight. Yes, I, I finished my course. I, I kept the faith. This was part of him keeping the faith. Because Paul could have easily said, man, I've been doing all this work for Christ. Man, I'm the great globe trying the catamician for Jesus Christ. I've been going here starting churches. I've been going here raising people to do the work of God. And yet he allows me to end up in jail? For real, God? Like, what's going on? If he'd have been us, I'm sure he wouldn't have made it to him. But Paul said, you know what? I'm going to keep the faith. Because I look at where I was. I look at where God found me. I was on my way to persecute the church of God. I was on my way and God, while I was en route to do harm to the body of Christ, God had to knock me down on my backside. God had to blind me. God had to knock me blind so that I really be able to see. I believe Paul really was the first one to say that I once was blind. But thank God that now I can see God had to knock him down for him to realize. And he said in that light, other folks saw the light, but they didn't see the man in the light. Paul was the one that saw the man in the light. Said Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Paul said, what you talking about? What you talking about? Talk? I, I, I haven't done anything. God really had to strike that man blind before he could ever truly see. Before he could ever truly see. So Paul said, if he was good enough to come and get me on the road to Damascus, if he was good enough to look beyond Everything I had said about him. If he was good enough to look beyond everything that I had done in the name of God. To tear down his kingdom. He's good enough for me to rejoice. He's good enough. He's good enough for me to rejoice. Man, I know. I know. You know what? Some of those people. I threw in prison. I'm sure they feel like I'm feeling right now. Yeah. Ooh, ain't too fun when the rabbit got the gun in. <laughs> ain't, ain't too fun. Ain't too fun, Brother Smith. Ain't too fun when the rabbit got the gun. I never thought about that. I never thought about that, how God 
put him in the same predicament that he had put others in. Let you know what goes around. Paul says, Paul says, children of God, I know, I know you're troubled in your spirit right now. And you're worried. You're anxious. You're upset. I am too. I did not expect to be here. I wasn't looking to go to jail. It happened. Because I was doing the will of God. Paul says, you know what? In all things, we have a reason to rejoice. God, in all things, has a purpose. And I believe this, he gives us, the people of God, the greatest model that we can ever have on what true faith is. And amidst a pandemic, amidst an election that ain't going to be over to 2021, <laughs> amidst <laughs> probably 2022, if that joke got anything to do with it. But amidst everything that we have going on, if you are a child of God, if your sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lamb, yeah. if you claim the name of Christ, I don't care what you're dealing with. I don't care what you're facing. You got a reason to rejoice. You have a reason. You have a reason to rejoice. You don't just have a reason. You got reasons on why you can rejoice. You ain't always been where you are. Half fucking say, preacher, ain't where I need to be right now. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Shame to death. Tell the truth. I wasn't always what I should be. I didn't always say it the way I should have said it. I didn't always do it the way that I should have did it. But he looked beyond all of that. And say you're still good enough for me to come out there on the auction block of sin. Buy your back from your own door. And if he was that good to me, I got a reason to rejoice. I got a reason to rejoice. I got a reason to be thankful. In all things, I'll be thankful. Man, that J.A. might have sent me a pink slip in my web. But hey, I'm still going to rejoice. I'm still going to rejoice. Man, God ain't going to let my life get turned up. I know. I know God ain't going to let that happen to me. I know he ain't going to let it happen. I'm going to put my faith in God. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to put my faith in him and rejoice. So in spite of what you're dealing with this morning, people of God, rejoice. Get rid of that anxiousness that you got. Whatever you're worried about, if you can't fix it, don't worry about it. Because if you can't fix it, what you're worried about it for anyway? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. He said, cast your cares upon me. Not people, because they got stuff they got to deal with just like you got stuff that you got to deal with. Cast your cares upon me because I care for you. He says, I'm gentle and I'm meek. I'm lowly in spirit and you'll find rest for your soul. Some of y'all say, you know what, preacher, sometimes I just need some rest. My spirit get tired. Lord, I need a, a little rest. My soul get a little weary every now and then. I, I need, I need rest. It is only in God that you can find that rest. And that has to do with his peace. As he said, that will guide your heart and your mind. In Christ Jesus. Rejoice. And again. I told you to rejoice. But I know something's going to happen that's going to make you forget that you need to rejoice. So that's why I'm going to write it again. And again. I say. Rejoice. 
Rejoice, child of God. Rejoice. A pandemic is going on. I know. Rejoice. Can't go on trips like you want to. Rejoice. Working from home. Thank God. You ain't got to dress. Rejoice. Hey, I got one witness right there. Hey, rejoice. I can't do all of what I used to. Rejoice. I tell you this morning, I passed a, a bunch of people coming through downtown that would gladly trade places with you. I passed a couple people downtown that had cots made up on the bridges that would gladly trade places with you. I passed a lot of folk downtown this morning that was waiting in line for a hot meal this morning, but you went down to your own refrigerator, got out what you wanted on your own stove, made yourself something to eat. Rejoice, because we so soon forget you was just one drink away from being that man. You was just one hit away from being that person. What? We are no better than the next individual. No better than the next person. Thank him for his grace and his mercy. That he kept us from that. And he has us where we are. Walking up the king's highway. Trouble come every now and then, but still we got to keep on walking of the kings. How will the devil gonna make sure that it's not an easy path? You got potholes every now and then might mess up your alignment, but guess what? You gotta keep on going now. The king's highway. And if you stay on this ship, people of God, one day this ship is gonna reach its destination to that on to the other side. And the people of God will go home to spend an eternity with him forever. That is our great hope. That is what we're waiting for. That is what we're looking for. That home that has been prepared for us. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Father, we don't know where you're going. Thomas been down for a long time. Thomas said, man, 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 man. I don't know where you're going. You ain't gave me no directions. He said, Father, we don't even know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, you're looking at the way. You're looking at the truth. You're looking at the light. No man can come to the Father except he come by me. God got a way you can't get over. You can't get on and you can't go around. You got to come in at the door. You got, you got, that's the door right there. You got to come in at the door. That's the doorway right there. When you have been baptized for the remission of your sin, the Bible says that you rise up to walk in newness of life. It says that old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And let me tell you, this right here is not an outward sign of an inward grace. Because if that was so, you don't need to be baptized. But it says that just as we are lowered down into the water, as Christ was lowered down into the earth, as you're being lowered down, you die to yourself. And you live, And while you are down in that water, I, Doc, I think this is the quickest surgery ever been done. While you ever, while you down in that water, God performs spiritual surgery on your spirit man while you are down in the water. And you rise up to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. But don't get it twisted thinking that, oh, I'm baptized. Now I'm on my way to heaven. Last time I checked, no one hands you a one-way ticket punch when you come out the water saying you're on your way to heaven. The Bible says that he that endureth until the end shall be saved. That means that after you have heard the gospel, after you believed it, after you've been baptized for the remission of your sin, it, it, it's not time for you to sit down and wait on Jesus to come. It's time to get busy. It's time to work out your soul salvation with fear and with trembling. It's time. The real work starts when you come out of that water. My friend, if you are here today and you have not yet experienced the wonder working power of the blood of the Lamb, if you have not yet had your sins washed away, if you are not a member of the church of Christ, I would have you to know, my friend, this morning, you come back here in his word. 
believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in the watery grave of baptism, have your sins washed away, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. Don't, don't misunderstand what I said. Folks still going to remember. They still going to bring it up. But God has forgotten it. And before him, you appear to be white as snow. And after you've been baptized for the remission of your sins, the Lord himself will add you to his body. According to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. If you're here today and you're already a Christian, but you're saying, Preacher, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm stressed about X, Y, and Z. I just need somebody to pray for me. The Bible still says that the prayers of the righteous, they avail as much. And we already said, if you can't fix it, don't worry about it. If you can't worry about it, you need to pray about it. So if you're here today and you're subject to the invitation, don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. The only time, the only moment you have promised to you is right now. What will you do with right now? And together we stand and sing the song of invitation.